Physiocrat, why have I called the channel that? It was originally the name of a blog. I've had the blog for about 10 years. The main aim is to promote the ideas of the 19th century American economist Henry George, but I didn't want to name the blog after a man or an ism, so I chose physiocrats who were a group of, I suppose, philosophers who lived in the 18th century and had similar set of ideas. Uh, it also gives me more scope. I'm an Orthodox Christian, so I want a bit of leeway to write and speak about other things now and again. OK, so let's have a look at the physiocrats and see who they were. Physiocrat means rule of nature. It comes from the Greek word physios, which is to do with nature, like we've got words such as physics, physical, physiotherapist. I've used the symbol phi for the avatar. This is the Cyrillic form of the letter because the Greek one looks like a London transport sign on its side. The physiocrats worked in 18th century France in the 50 years before the revolution. But why should we bother with their long dead ideas? Well, they're important for a number of reasons. They were the first to put the study of political economy, that's economics, as we'd call it today, on a sound scientific basis. They were a group of people who were part of the court of King Louis XV, who'd come to the throne and found the state coffers empty and there was unrest because of food shortages. Louis XIV had emptied the funds on extravagances like Versailles and wars. So France was in a bad state by the time that Louis XV came to the throne. One of their most important achievements was that they refuted the theory of mercantilism, which was the idea that a state should do what it can to get as much gold into the country as possible, which was the driving force behind 16th and 17th century Spain and Portugal especially. They devoted vast resources to shipping gold across the Atlantic because they thought it would make the country wealthy, but it had other effects which were not so good. So the physiocrats were the founders of the School of Classical Economics, which makes them forerunners of better known figures like Adam Smith, David Ricardo and others. And interestingly, their ideas were then rediscovered in the following century by the American economist Henry George. And that was separate and independent. Apparently he hadn't come across them until somebody pointed out that he'd come to the same conclusion. They regarded agriculture as the only fertile economic activity. They regarded manufacturing and industry as sterile, which might sound strange to us, but it was primarily an agricultural economy. But then there's a deeper truth that we don't live apart from nature, so they weren't so stupid, perhaps, and irrelevant. They made some fundamental observations. One of them is that all taxes eventually come out of land rent. This is something that was noticed when they had the British Enterprise Zones in the 1980s. There was a rates holiday, so-called, and rents rose by pretty much the amount of the rates that didn't have to be paid. But other taxes also feed through into land rents and tend to depress them, so it's a broader observation. It also follows from Ricardo's law of rent. They advocated two policies... And the two policies were to go together. They couldn't be separated. One was free trade, laissez-faire. The term comes from the call that was made by the referee in medieval tournaments. It means a fair field and no favours. What they called the single tax, l'impôt unique, is land value taxation. Now, if you look in... Wikipedia, you'll find there's a number of twists on that, like people have said it was the flat tax, which it isn't. There was a great reluctance to take on board the idea of having the two policies together. The people didn't seem to understand that you've got to have both. 
So what you might call the right wing, the political liberals, went off with the idea of free trade, laissez-faire, but they didn't go along with the single tax. Now, the single tax is effectively the nationalisation or partial nationalisation of land rent. So it's a kind of nationalisation. You might have thought that the left would have gone off with it. Well, they, I don't know, they got mixed up and thought that nationalisation or public ownership of everything and anything was a good thing. But it, it was a split and it was an unnecessary split because you could see it as the origin of all the arguments that have gone on ever since. So let's have a look at some of the characters. De Gournay seems to have been the founder of the movement. Notice it's about the same time as the Enlightenment. Whether they belong to the Enlightenment is something I wouldn't like to say. It's contemporary, obviously. And he was a government minister and he was a keen advocate of getting rid of government regulations. François Quenet was the king's doctor and confidant, obviously, and he published the Tableau Economique. He's best known for that. And he seems to be the person who worked out somehow that all taxes come out of rent. Dupont de Nemours coined the term physiocracy and wrote a book, another advocate of free trade, low tariffs. He was an influence on Adam Smith. He narrowly escaped the guillotine after the revolution and emigrated to America. And he's the founder of the DuPont Corporation in the United States. The Marquis de Mirabeau, I just put him in for completeness. And now we come to Turgot, who's the most influential politically of the physiocrats. He was controller of finance, I suppose, a sort of chancellor. Turgo tried to introduce tax and trade reforms to deal with the poverty and food shortages in the earlier part of the reign of Louis XVI, and he had the king's support. But he failed. There was too much opposition from vested interests, and the absolute monarch wasn't really so absolute after all. And he had to cave into the vested interests, which had tragic results because in 1783-84 there was the volcanic eruption in Iceland which caused the famine and then there were continuing unrests which led to the French Revolution. Whether the French Revolution would have happened if the Turgot reforms had gone through is an interesting question. I suspect the answer is it probably wouldn't and France would have evolved into a constitutional monarchy. I think maybe it's time that King Louis XVI was rehabilitated. He did try to support reforms in the early part of his reign, and it wasn't his fault that they couldn't happen. The reforms of Turgot that never happened are very similar to the reforms that still haven't happened because the policies of protection, subsidies and taxation of goods and services which dominate most countries and are enshrined in the EU's structure, are precisely the same as those that the physiocrats tried to get rid of in the middle of the 18th century. And mercantilism hasn't gone away either. Mercantilist thinking lies behind the idea that a balance of payment surplus is automatically a good thing and that countries must export at, if necessary, all costs. You can see it in China... You can see it in the EU, it's implicit in the ideas that are driving government policy in Britain after Brexit. Henry George is a footnote to the physiocrats who is in many ways more important than the physiocrats themselves. He lived a century later in America. Like the physiocrats, he wasn't academically qualified. He came independently to substantially the same conclusions as the physiocrats and he published those in a book called Progress and Poverty which came out in 1879. It's online although I don't think the online version is the best of them. 
I strongly recommend if you want to follow this up, you get yourself a copy of the Hogarth Press edition. They're about £15 these days. It was published in 1953. It's, it's an abridgment of the original work. George was influential in liberal politics from the time the book came out, from in 1880 until certainly up to the First World War, and then it continued to have an influence within the British Liberal Party until the, probably about 1960, I'd say. One of the more lasting fruits of the work of Henry George is the game of Monopoly, which was originally called the Landlord's Game, and it was designed to teach the ideas of Henry George. The ideas were also applied in Japan at the start of industrialization. And they were picked up by the Chinese politician Sun Yat-sen. And they're an important influence in the financial systems of the Far East tiger economies, in one way or another, which include Hong Kong, Singapore and Taiwan. And they were also picked up in Australia, in some of the states at least, and indeed in South Africa for a time. It's a pity they weren't continued after independence in 1995. We wouldn't be having this problem with the Boer farmers, for example. Now, some people argue that land isn't important anymore. They point to Google and Amazon and these other digital giants. They're wrong. The wealth created by those firms ends up in commercial and residential land values around their head offices and where their technicians live, for example, in Silicon Valley, land values are sky high there. The row over the right to fish in British waters is another example of the importance of land because in economics, fish in the sea falls into the category of land. I'd like to think that I've convinced you that the physiocrats are still important. You won't learn much about them though, if anything, if you do a university course in economics. Their ideas need to be rediscovered because they really are key to unlocking contemporary economic problems which are apparently completely intractable and also ignoring the principles that they set out gives rise to looking-glass economics.